the Diversum Cabernet Sauvignon. This has been a wine project that I've been working on for roughly six years and trying to figure out exactly where I wanted my Cabernet program to be. And the Grand Cast Cabernet kind of came naturally. Uh, it's the wine that I wanted to be kind of my go, go big, go home iteration of what Napa Valley Cabernet really could be. Now, for those of you that have been following MTJ for a while, um, you kind of know this story, is that I really never saw myself as the that go big, go home Napa Valley Cabernet maker. In fact, I damn near swore off from doing that because I really wanted to be known for what I had become known for, which was Merlot, uh, Pinot Gris, Riesling, Pinot Noir, kind of all these other varieties. But it was one of those things where people were clamoring for Cabernet. So I started kind of dipping my toes into the Cabernet world in 2015, just a hair, and it really started picking up in 2017. As those years went on, we were moving towards kind of this grand cask idea, and that really came to fruition with the 2020 vintage, which is why uh, the first vintage of the grand cask uh, came in 2020. Now, fast forward to 2022, uh, as the grand cask was still aging in barrel, it's a full, gosh, uh, 30 months in barrel for that wine to just get bottled, and then months after that until it's finally released. I started coming up with a, another idea of kind of what we could do to complement that particular wine. And it was inspired by a trip, uh, this is gonna sound really bougie, uh, but a trip to the south of France uh, where I met, you know, a, who, a now mutual friend, uh, where one of my best friends really got into the wine industry and decided to be a winemaker. And this gentleman was doing things with big red wines that I had never experienced before. Um, it was a very inspirational moment, and all of a sudden, it was like I could see through the matrix. It was like, oh, this is this is possible. Let's all right. Let's see if we can push these boundaries and do this with a Napa style of wine. So while the Grand Cask had, was coming to kind of fruition, we had some 2022 Cabernet in the cellar. That frankly, we had too much cavern. We 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 had more than I needed for the MTGA kind of line of wines, even including what we were doing with the Grand Cask. And realistically, when you have excess wine like that with a small producer, you're probably not even going to cover your costs with it. You're going to sell it off as bulk wine, and it's going to be maybe breaking even or less and nothing's gonna really come of it. It's just gonna get blended into someone else's big production typically. And you're really not gonna have a chance to do something kind of fun with it. So I opted to say, hey, let's cut a few barrels from the herd and let's try this winemaking style. Let's see if this dude in the South of France really is onto something or maybe I'm just crazy and it's not gonna work. So this wine, instead of doing the typical Napa Cabernet thing of, you know, new French oak barrels, maybe a little blend of, you know, Cab Franc or Merlot into it here or there. Um, we literally did the exact opposite of all of that. Uh, we really wanted the Grand Cask and this wine to kind of be a yin and a yang to one another, that, you know, the light side versus the dark side, and they have to be in some semblance of equilibrium, right? So that was the goal is that, hey, if I'm gonna make this go big or go home cab, let's see what the exact opposite would be. And that might sound a little weird. It, it, it's something that I'm telling you that no one else in Napa is doing. There's not a single producer that I know of doing anything remotely like this wine. And it's really how we came up with the name. Diversum is Latin for, in essence, different or opposite or unlike. And that's why kind of the Grand Cask and this wine are tied together, is because I wanted this to be unlike or opposite of what the Grand Cask has come to be. So it is a 2022 vintage, and every year we'll release this as well as the Grand Cask at the same time. So the Grand Cask will always be three years old. This will always be about one year old when they're released. So again, just on the aging time alone, very, very different. Number two is the barrel selection. This never sees new French oak. It is 
actually in neutral oak for a few months, and then we end up racking it and moving a decent portion of this wine into stainless steel where it sits for the rest of its aging. And so after about 10 months, this ends up getting bottled and ready to release in November. It is quite literally the exact opposite of what the production of the Grand Cask is. And I know what you might be thinking at this point. You're crazy. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty solid reaction because that's what my close friends have told me. Uh, but this is something that, you know, kind of, it just became this passion project of like, okay, there's a lot of people chasing that Napa Cabernet Dragon in terms of how big and sexy can we make it. All right, can we make a big sexy Cabernet doing the exact opposite of what everybody else is doing in terms of their production techniques? And also not using any extracts, additives, or as little as you could possibly imagine because you still consider things like yeast and sulfites to be additives. Uh, but we're not gonna doctor this up. This isn't meant to be your 1999 bottle of Cabernet that has oak flavoring in it or vanilla flavoring in it or fruit flavoring with mega purple and all this other process nonsense. This is meant to be as honest as a Cabernet as it can be while still making it in a way that is a little bit more simplistic, a little bit more just, hey, we're trying to retain the greatness of the fruit itself and not relying on something like a new French oak barrel to add a certain layer of complexity to it. And for that reason, it's just been, for me personally, it's been a real challenge. It's been an immense amount of fun because it is just so different than anything that I've done personally. And it's so different than what anyone else is doing outside of a handful of people in the world in terms of the wine industry. It's definitely not something that anyone would consider doing with Napa Cabernet. And for that reason, I am ecstatic to finally get it out into the world. The first thing you're gonna notice about this wine when you try it is that it is what we call very primary in terms of its characteristics. The fruit characteristics are what dominate this wine because it's a young Cabernet and you don't have that new oak component to kind of back it up. The key thing though that I wanted to hang on to in this one is that it can't be just a red wine. It can't be just be fleshy and nondescript. It needs to have some sort of X factor to it, like many of our wines have, to make sure that it still retains some sort of interest and complexity. And that is what I think we have been able to achieve. It is a wine that is just bright, it's beautiful, it still has that great structure to it. This is a Cabernet that you could even chill down a little bit, just throw it in the fridge or keep it on top of like an ice bucket. That way it's a nice, cool, big red that you can enjoy on a hot day. Um, it's gonna be great with a variety of foods because of how unique it is, uh, whether it's your Thanksgiving dinner and a little bit of turkey and cranberry sauce to go along with that, whether you're diving into a good cut of red meat, some grilled veggies, barbecue, it's gonna do a little bit of everything. It is, this, I, I can't really put it into words how excited I am to have this wine in kind of our portfolio of wines at this stage because it is just so unique and so different compared to what anything else is out there uh, coming from the Napa Cabernet side of things. Yeah, it's gonna be, um, this is gonna be a little different and it's gonna be a little challenge to everyone's taste buds, I think, including my own. Uh, but I, I am so, so thankful that I have the opportunity to be able to play around a little bit in the cellar and make a wine that is just unique. That's been one of my pet peeves about Napa Cabernet for more than a decade now, is that it feels as though between certain barrel producers, certain consultants, certain styles have become very, very prevalent and that Napa Cabernet has homogenized at a pretty outrageous rate. And it's hard to find a diversity and truly unique wines in Napa. Uh, they're out there, don't get me wrong. Uh, there are some amazing producers doing amazing things. But I think it is time kind of with the theme of being very transparent with our winemaking techniques, uh, being you know very 
edgy with some of the wines that we're creating in terms of pushing boundaries. I think it's just a, it's an amazing time to start doing all of those things and really hopefully showing you all that love great wine for Napa that there are an immense amount of possibilities out there. And for us, we love being those mad scientists here in our cellars, just seeing how good we can make a wine and how unique uh, we can make a wine from the vineyards that we work with. So. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm very excited to share this wine for you, uh, with you, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Cheers.